got a homework set over chapter three, the continuity and differentiability that we've looked at, so chapter three and six that we've looked at. Any kind of questions over that yet? Yes? So all of the multiple choice, they only have one answer, correct? Oh. Uh, because the way some of them are asked, I guess I'm kind of confused if it's one answer. I would assume it's one, but I guess, I don't know. Um, do you have one in particular? I, I'm not sure I brought mine with me to even. Well, today I want to talk about something I, I think is a little bit related. We've looked at the idea of the, the Blackman's Blackman function, or Blackman's curve, the one that's on the front of our book, that's continuous everywhere, and, and, but differential nowhere. And uh, it, it definitely illustrates what's known as self-similarity. There's, there's a part of it that looks exactly the same as the whole thing. So really with, with any fractal, that's kind of the idea. We, we do something, we do it again, we do it again, we do it again, and we end up with a big piece and it has smaller pieces that look exactly like the big piece. So are, are there any fractals you're kind of aware of? Like in real life? Or that you've heard of in, in other classes? Yes, they, they, they do a, a fractal. I mean, certainly uh, a fractal fern is one of the things that is, is used as an example. 
you've got a fern, or even just, I guess, growing a tree. You know, you, you start saying split, and then from each split, you get a split, and each split, you get a split. Now, I'm not quite sure how, how this was done before people had nice ways to sort of produce these, to, to produce computer graphics with that, but I think people were studying fractals for that. Um, one of the fairly famous ones, suppose we have a triangle, and we join the midpoints, and we, we you know, shade the middle. The middle, I guess, fourth. And then we do that same thing again. Now we've got three smaller triangles, and we shade the middle fourth of each of the smaller ones. And we do that again. So here we kind of illustrate that. We get some dots, and we're just randomly going and getting more dots, and so it keeps adding dots, adding dots, adding dots. We're not really seeing much. If, if I speed up this calculator, um, I'm no longer restricted to the actual speed, so it just goes really fast. We see this Kripsky triangle. It's very, very unusual that we get that, and then it turns itself off, because the calculator, after, like, Three minutes of inactivity shuts itself off. Well, when it's on hyperspeed, three minutes of activity is in about three seconds, and it shuts itself off with that. But um, we get the Sierpinski triangle. And so I kind of wonder, you know, could I do that here in GeoGebra? So we've got. Um, I'm going to add more and more points. So, so here are a few points. Back here I've added 52 points. And we don't see a lot of pattern going on. In fact, notice if I move this first one, I can see a few others move. And a few of these may be outside the pattern. But before long, they all start meeting the pattern. And we use more and more and more and more of these. We get the Sierpinski pattern. So I kind of wondered, you know, what, what's so special? say about three sides. What if I go to, to four sides? I've got to kind of move the point to get it to, to redraw and 
Well, four sides I'm not seeing much. What if I change this probability a little bit so that it actually goes closer to one corner rather than, than halfway? Goes closer to one. Well, we get the we get a kind of Sierpinski square looking figure. Well, if we go to five sides, we get kind of pentagons. Six sides, we get a hexagon, and each little hexagon is about the same as the whole big. So we get the little puddles all around for that as we use more and more and more. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. That, that what seemed to be totally different ways, <coughs> here we're randomly putting points. And so that's another way it's sometimes described as the idea of chaos. It could be this or this, this or this. We don't really know which. But over the course of time, can we figure out what would happen? Turns out for Sapinski triangle, the answer is yes. And that's a totally different process than this of let's always take out the middle third, or the middle, I guess, middle fourth. On a number line, if we take out the middle third, so one third to two thirds, if we remove that, so we've got starting all the way from 0 to 1, take out the middle third, and then take out another middle third, and then another middle third. We get what's known as the Cantor set, which also has some very interesting properties. And is also related to the idea of fractals. The here kind of describes the Cantor set, taking out the middle third, and then the middle third of those, the middle third of, of those, the middle third of those, and we get the Cantor set. Interestingly enough, there's a, there's a at least two more ways to produce the Sapinski triangle. Another way, uh, are you familiar with um, Pascal's triangle? Probably have looked at that statistics that we've got one, and then one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one, one, four, six, four, one, the binomial coefficients. produce Pascal's triangle. What do you think is going to happen there if, say, we go and shade all the even numbers? Everything that's divisible by 2. Let me switch to a different calculator. Try to switch to a different calculator. Only because it has more resolution. Which maybe it won't. So here's one. Pascal, we're going to shade all the multiples of 2. So we start shading. So it's just going through the rows. It's about to the 10th row here. But it's shading all the multiples of 2 and, and not shading the odd ones. So notice this row is not shaded. Uh, I think row 7 probably isn't shaded. But notice what we're getting. Sierpinski triangle, the whole thing, and any little portion of it looks like the entire process. And this one also, if I let it run faster, it'll build that whole thing. And that's, you know, I think that's kind of cool. And for me, that's one of the things that's really interesting about mathematics. Questions that seem to be not at all related, suddenly we 
get the same answer kind of either way we look at it or we discover something in Pascal's triangle that we studied somewhere else. If we did this, say, with um, multiples of three, Sierpinski triangle looking figure, not exactly the same, but in fact almost kind of two across instead of just one, but, but we get a, a Sierpinski looking figure with this. Here's Sierpinski, and the idea here is we start with um, we start with a line, and the next iteration we're going to put a segment half as long up above it over all the pieces. So I guess we split it into two pieces and move half of it up here, above. And so we're going to do that idea repeatedly. So we begin to think, okay, what happens if I do this again? So if I start at this point, and now with each of those three pieces, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to cut this one in half and put a half up above it, this one in half and put half up above it, this one in half and put half up above it something that looks like that. Do it again, do it again, and if we do it repeatedly, we get Sierpinski's triangle. <coughs> Doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, we can draw in Sierpinski's triangle. Uh, there's also one where double Sierpinski, working with a trapezoid, a continuous curve. So where we start with this part and then on the blue segments we're rep so each of these we're going to be placed with this piece but on the blue ones we're going to go in the opposite direction. So we're going to come this way on the this one back this way on this one, and up this way on the one in the middle. So we're going to place each of those segments by the three pieces. So we get to our second one, our third one, our fourth, and with each one of these we're connecting the endpoints, so it is a continuous curve, and if we do this indefinitely, we get sort of a continuous Sierpinski curve all the way draws along, and we've got Sierpinski, but still a fractal, definitely, because the top half looks exactly like the whole thing, this part looks exactly like the whole thing, this little part up here, exactly like the whole thing, we get the self-similarity. Now, this particular one definitely enables us to do some things where, you know, maybe we're not quite sure what's going to happen. So say we've got a straight line, and, and we're going to, on each piece now, repeat this pattern. So I've got that pattern, then on each piece, I'm going to put that hump in the middle, a corner in the middle. And we're going to think, well, what would happen? 
happened there? And keep going, keep going, and what happens is we do this indefinitely, we get this type of fractal curve, which I think is close to what they call the, the tuck snowflake. Here's a fern, which was also done with this idea of rearranging some things, I think losing some pieces of it as well. But there, there have been times, and I think there still is quite a bit of research into, say, image uh, compression, where if you can figure out an easy rule for this, you don't have to store the whole image, you just store the easy rule. Send the easy rule, the computer on the other end is fast enough to regenerate this, it doesn't have to actually be stored. It's easier to transmit a few instructions than the whole picture. Or go the other way, if you can start from a picture and simplify it down to a few easy instructions, well that would make like facial recognition software much easier to work if every face was really you know, reduced to a few easy instructions. It's a lot easier to, to look through them all than it is if you're matching, you know, 10,000 points on a face, if there was something with five or six, with that, the, the, the software could run up a lot more rapidly and, and you know, make better matches and make them more quickly. But it's, I think, very interesting to, to think about the different types of examples that can be done here and, and just create art this way. Scary broccoli, we've got Halloween coming up tomorrow, so we've got the scary broccoli. Uh, I don't know who decided to name some of these, but you know, we'll put arrows in and smaller arrows and smaller arrows. But just different things that people have, have worked and studied. Kind of the serpents or the, you know, the, the five sided stars, Maybe a dragon curve, five. I mean, just certainly with, with this kind of software, you can say, well, what if I do this? What kind of things would happen? And I'm not sure before this software how people were really visualizing what was going to happen. But I think this kind of software would be you know, very much needed. So here's the one I, I sort of did. It's done a little bit better here in terms of you know, the first step, the second step, the third, the fourth, and as we just let it go, we get the whole uh, coat curve, or from two segments, and just different ways you could produce the same thing. And, and how would you know up front what you were going to produce? How would you describe that? But uh, Landscapes and, and computer generated movies are often done with fractals. Um, where did I see? I guess I can't find that particular video. Uh, should have flagged that when I saw it. <coughs> thinking somebody put a video of kind of what, how they were working to create Elsa's hair in Frozen to, to make it actually look like hair and, and how do you do that, not how do you braid it in real life, how did they do it in computer graphics. Uh, This is Pixar Studios. 
I'm sure almost everyone's heard of them and watched their movies. They've, uh, they've won a few awards along the way too. But less people realise just how much mathematics and science goes into animating these films. Even the boss here is a computer scientist. This is Tony DeRose and he leads the research group at Pixar. And today he's talking to us here at Number Five. Well, my particular area of, of interest is in, in geometric modeling, creating shapes of things. And uh, that problem comes up a lot around here because we've got characters with you know, pretty complicated shapes. You know, some of the characters on the board behind me. Uh, this, is a, this is a sculpture of the hand of Jerry from Jerry's Game, a character in a short film that we did quite a few years ago now. It, it, you know, just it's a complicated shape, and we needed to develop some way of representing these kinds of shapes in a way that artists could deal with, but computers could could render and display quickly as well. So Jan Pinker, the director of Jerry's Game, was also a sculptor. So he uh, created the sculpture of Jerry's hand, and then he later digitized it and made the final surface that appeared uh, on the screen. Let's simplify first, and, and we'll get back to surfaces in three dimensions in a minute. But let's start, say, with curves in two dimensions to explain the basics of the process. So what I've got here is a little four-point polygon, and it's going to be my job to make a smooth curve out of it. I'm going to make a smooth curve out of it by just repeating a few simple steps. So the first step I'm going to call split, and what that does is it adds midpoints to the edges. So now I've got eight points, but it's not really any smoother. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a little bit smoother by repositioning all eight of these points. So this guy, for instance, is going to move from where he is now to the midpoint of his right neighbor. Similarly, this guy is going to move to his right neighbor. Let me kind of make that for you. I'll call that the averaging step. So now I've got eight points, a little bit smoother. And again, my goal is to make a smooth curve, and so I'm just going to repeat. Split and average, so now I've got 16 points, again a little bit smoother. Uh, I'll put those two steps into a combined step I'll call subdivide, and you see that as I continue to subdivide, the uh, smooth curve starts to emerge. And that's the basis of how we uh, create all of our surfaces. This, this splitting and averaging idea also works for surfaces. So here's an example so I start over and over again. So if I split, um, it's a little more complicated for surfaces to split. I have to insert edge midpoints like this one here, like I did for curves. And I also have to introduce the middles of faces. But again, that's just done by averaging. So this point here is just the average of the four points around it. And then I average. In this case, I need to use a carefully constructed weighted average for reasons we may talk about in a minute. Uh, but if I pick my averaging weights carefully enough, um, I can continue the split and average process and generate smooth surfaces in one. And that's exactly how Jerry's hand, and in fact, Jerry himself was built. Well, here, for instance, are the points that we digitized off this, this sculpture. Before subdivision, we run the splitting and averaging process a lot of times, and that smooths the surface out and creates the, the smooth shape that you ultimately see on the screen. To the untrained person, which I very much am, this seems sort of, it doesn't seem very subtle. It seems like anything you feed into this process will just kind of get blobized in the same way, everything will get turned into this kind of generic blob. Is there, is there more nuance to this than what, than what it looks like, or has everything turned into a big blur? Uh, well, there is some nuance. There are some magic numbers involved. <laughs> so let's get a sense of what those numbers are. One pair of magic numbers are, are one, one, here. those are the weights that I've used in this averaging step when I move things to the points. And those are magic because you can show that a nice thing happens in the limit of this subdivision. So this 1-1 one, one means he's going to go to the spot that is one part of where he is now and one part of where his right neighbor is now. Okay, so let's do that. Let's, let's, uh, each stage is split followed by average. So there's the split. So when he moves according to the 1-1 one, one rule, he's going to move from where he is now to here. And this guy's going to move from where he is now to here, and so on. So we'll see that. And we just keep repeating that process. And a beautiful thing happens. In the limit, you can show that this curve is a, uh, there's a parabolic arc that sits in here. And there's another parabolic arc that sits in here. And those two parabolic arcs meet with a smooth derivative, a smooth tangent line at this point. And that's all just an emergent property of this subdivision process. There are some other magic numbers I can use, for instance, 
if I use one, two, one, so I split it before. Now if I use the one, two, one rule, this guy is going to move from where he is now to two parts of where he is now. Uh, one part of his left neighbor and one part of his right neighbor. So, so, it's right one, so, two, he's, one. so he's carrying more of his weight. Yeah, exactly. And so if I average with that set of weights, I get a shape like this. I continue to split an average. Again, something really nice happens. When we use the 1 1 rule, we got piecewise parabolas, which are degree 2 curves. Here we're going to get degree 3 curves. And if I pick weights 1, 3, 3, 1, and do this process, it turns out you get uh, degree 4 curves. And this pattern is probably familiar to many of your viewers, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1. Those are all rows of something called Pascal's triangles. So what we're learning here is that if you pick your weights carefully, that is, from rows of Pascal's triangle, the curves that you get in the limit are nice and smooth, and they're polynomials, and the degree of the polynomial is given by how deep into Pascal's triangle you pick your weights. But you don't have to pick your carefully. You don't have to pick your weights carefully. Um, I can, in fact, I don't even have to make the weights positive. So suppose I pick weights one minus two and three. So I split as before, and now this guy is going to go to a point which is minus one times himself, one times his left neighbor, and three times his right neighbor. No idea what's going to happen. Yeah, let's see what happens. Oh, okay, something interesting. Let's continue. We we'll keep doing that. So what we're seeing here is, in the limit, if you don't pick your weights carefully, you get something that isn't smooth anywhere. In fact, it's a fractal. So when I watch one of your films, which one is the right one? Which one creates the surfaces that make you happy? Well, it turns out that for surfaces, this Pascal's triangle pattern doesn't work anymore. You have to use uh, a, a different set of mathematical tools to figure out weights that are going to generate smooth objects in the limit. And uh, these are very carefully chosen weights. Uh, they were first discovered by Ed Cap 40 years ago uh, as the president of Pixar. Do we know those, like, are they like, like fractions? Are they, what numbers are they? Are they like 1, 1.7 and 3.92 or? Uh, well, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but there's a simple formula that is now well known. You can find it on our website. So when you've got your 3D object, they're the, they're the ones you plug in and then bang. Yeah, exactly. So when I was doing the subdivision with the cube, we were using those very carefully constructed weights that they had discovered. We do the subdivision process a few times, and it, it, that gets points that are kind of close to where they would go if we did it an infinite number of times. But on top of that, there's a few tricks that we use to figure out exactly where they're going to go. Mathematically, we, we think about what would happen if we did it an infinite number of times. And it turns out that we can write down exactly what happens if we did do it an infinite number of times. That's great. Which, yeah, so let's, let's see how that works. All right, all right. Then let's start with an observation here. So I'm going to go back to the simple one one rule that we had earlier. And uh, watch what happens on, say, this leg of the polygon. So I'm going to split an average. And notice that what happened here is that I still have two points on this polygon leg, but just a little bit closer. If I split an average again, again I get two points on this leg, they're just a little closer together. If I do it again, again they're closer. So what's going to happen if I do this an infinite number of times? Well, these two points are going to get closer and closer together. In the limit, they'll be on top of each other. And the location where they converge is the midpoint of the original leg. So without doing any computation at all, I can determine very quickly that these four blue points are on that limit object. And the nice thing about that observation is that it holds at every stage of subdivision. Watch what happens on this leg of the polygon. So this leg wasn't in my original arrangement, but it got introduced after the first stage. And as I split an average, we're going to again see uh, two points on this same line. They just get closer and closer together as I subdivide. And again, they're going to converge to the midpoint of the leg that was first introduced. So let's go back to that arrangement here. So I know that the midpoint of this leg is also on the limit object. So after one stage of subdivision, I already know eight points exactly. You refer to this thing called the limit object. 
That's the finished product. That's the finished product, right? So it's the mathematically perfect version. And now I've got eight points that are on the mathematically perfect curve. Computing what happens in the limit becomes a little bit more delicate when we look at one of these other rules, like the one two one rule. So let's see if we can track where this point goes as I subdivide. So we're using a one two one now. This is a one two one rule. So if I split an average, okay. So he moved some distance. Let me split an average again. He's moved a little bit more. It's not exactly clear where he's going to stop. He's not on the limit object. He's not on the limit object yet. So, but yet we can compute exactly where he's going to go with some other magic numbers. Let's take a look at how that works. I'm going to draw a little piece of my curve, my original polygon. And since this is my original polygon, I'm going to... I'll put a link in and let you finish it if you'd like. But you're never quite sure when you pull something up off YouTube whether it's really going to do what you want. But a lot of our words came up there. Smooth curves, continuous, uh, limiting process. So a lot of the things that we've been talking about in a field that seems totally unrelated to what we've been talking about with advanced calculus, and yet some of those topics come up. And so people studying some mathematics and what's happening to computer generate movies. I think it's just really cool that, that it has that kind of application, even though you know, we just a number of these we just started looking to think, well, what, what happens if we do this? What happens? What happens? And then somebody thought, oh, what if I apply that process here? How is that going to work? To, to take things that, that look kind of rough, you know, a, a rough rendering of a hand, and smooth it so it doesn't look rough anymore. It looks smooth. So. It uses Java, which has been shut down, so we're not seeing the, the actual game. They call it the chaos game. Essentially, it's like we want to get in one of these spots. Well, what sequence of, of vertices do we need to go with? You know, one, three, or two, one, three, to end up in a certain location. Five on Monday.